James Phelps has what may be considered by most men to be the perfect job. He takes photos of women in lingerie to use in magazines and print media. James also has cerebral palsy. Today, we talk about how those two components intersect. This is Caroline from Caroline's Adventure. We all face challenges in our lives. How do some people take those challenges and turn them into powerful results? Join me as we dig into a story on resilience, hope, and joy, and uncover lessons we can each use in our own lives. But before we start, please take a moment to show that five-star rating button some love, and follow while you're there to be updated every time I release a new episode. Now, before we begin, a word of caution. On this podcast, we regularly discuss topics like sexual assault, suicide, and addiction, which may be disturbing to some. Please take care as you listen. And if you need support in the United States, reach out to the Crisis Text Line at 741-741. What made you decide to do the podcast? You know, I started social media from kind of an odd approach. Um, I had an accident about 12 years ago now, and Mm -hmm. um, I was hit by a a driver while I was on a closed street at a peach festival up in um, Middletown, Delaware. Yeah, elderly driver. She hit and ran, but luckily it was a peach festival, so she couldn't go anywhere. And um, she passed away, I think, six months after the accident. So we never did get a chance to find out how she even got on the road or what she was doing. She was just cruising down the road and hit me from behind. And it did a lot of damage. I had to do a lot of surgeries from it. I had to relearn how to walk. I, um, But the, one of the big ones was that it messed with my memory. And uh-huh. so I started social media initially just as a daily blog to create kind of a, a cookie crumb trail where if something ever happened again that messed with my memory, I wanted something that kind of gave me the ability to recreate it. So I started social media just from that standpoint, like, and, and still most of my posts are primarily just from my own memories. Um, oh, okay. That's yeah. smart. Yeah. It's, it, I mean, and, and it's funny because, you know, all my kids stuff, all that stuff, it's as much for me as it is for anyone else. I was shocked when people actually started following. Like I can remember when I hit a thousand and I was like, that's crazy. And it kept growing and people kept asking for different kinds of content and more content. And I'm like, I'm not that exciting. Like there's only so many times I can post during a day. And so so I can't remember. Someone suggested a podcast. And at first I was like, I know nothing about podcasting. Like, you know, I listen to podcasts, but I have no idea how to do one or any of the logistics with it. Um, But people kept suggesting a podcast. And so finally I was like, you know what, what have I got? I'm a big fan of like, what have I got to lose? I will try almost anything twice because, you know, it's, it's one of those where you never know what you'll have fun with or what you'll be good at until you try it. Okay. What do I know enough about to talk about? I've had a crazy upbringing and I knew a lot about going through challenges and using those as a, a path to enabling me to succeed. You know, and what I realized is talking with successful people, it's never a direct line from start to finish. You know, we Uh look at successful people and we think they started here, they went straight up and they're now super successful. And the reality is that super successful people, lots of times they will have lots of failures along the way, but Uh each time they fail, they're a little bit further ahead than they were when they failed the last time. Right. And so that was where I was like, okay, I'm going to talk with people and see what it is, you know, what struggles have they overcome in life? How did they do it? Um, and what can we learn from that? Because when you're in the the depths of a, of a struggle, it's hard sometimes to remember that this is part of the process. And That's true. Yeah. It, yeah. And it, and so it's nice sometimes to listen to other people's stories and learn from them so that you can kind of, realize that you're not alone in this and that there is always a light at the end of the tunnel, no matter how dark it is and how Roger, bad it yeah. is, there's always a light in the, in the heat of the moment. It always feels like you, you'll never get through it. And then you get through it. Oh. And you're like, oh, that was way better than I expected. Yes. So that's what got me into podcasting. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, you have a, a your branding is very. That was one reason why I contacted you about doing a shoot because oh, this person has the type of look and the branding that I'm used to working with photo shoot wise. So like, okay, the visuals are something that the the male or the heterosexual or lesbian followers are gonna look at, but then there's depth and there's something behind it that's gonna keep you there. So they kind of come in for one thing, but the and they're paying attention is the key word. They're paying attention <laughs> to what you're doing. There's depth and there's something there beyond just the other stuff. So you so you're wise in how you're able to kind of post something for plausible deniability, but at the same time, if they're watching the videos or reading the captions for, for the post, it's like, oh, okay, this, okay, this, yeah, let me stay and let me continue. So you're, you definitely know how to market yourself on two different wavelengths, but it's quality stuff on both sides. So it works for uh, whoever the viewers are like. The females, they're, they, they can see it's inspirational or just say, oh, wow, you know, she's going through what I'm going through. And of course, like I said, the guys are, or doing what the guys do. Either way, it's still quality on both end, and that's why I see why your numbers are growing. Where they are. Thank you. And it is tough, you know, as a woman in America. It's different when I travel internationally, but in America, uh -huh. you're commoditized from a very early age. And unfortunately, yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, I I was um, I, in fifth grade. I was a C cup, and I went up a cup size at least a year um, uh -huh. all the college and. Nothing teaches you how to to handle that. You know, my family life at the time was a train wreck. My um, my parents were going through a horrible divorce. My father had a um, motorcycle accident where he ended up with severe head injury. Um, uh -huh. we, we relocated from North Carolina up to Maryland. Like my personal life was in so much turmoil, and right. nothing prepared me for suddenly having this body where. People wanted to tell you, and, and and the messages are always conflicting. You're either overdressed or underdressed. You're either over-sexualized or under-sexualized. And lots of times it's the exact same outfit, but you're going to get criticized right. every single yeah. angle. You, as an adult, you'll go back to your childhood and remember hearing things that had double meanings. You're yeah. like, what? Oh, you've grown up so beautifully. And you got to think, was that a compliment or was it like a creepiness to these compliments that i shouldn't be getting yes but at the time the culture that was seen as what you say but in the thinking about it's like ah, yeah and hugs and all these things that you, you as you grew up you wonder was that a hug because you missed me and we hugged me for another reason and it just yeah i i can see why women have so much to deal with and why it's such a a, a cross to to bear or to carry that's unnecessary. You already had enough going on in your life and now you have this and yeah. you don't know who to trust. And at the same time, you don't want to just stay in the house under the covers because the world's out there to be explored. But if you explore the world and then even back then, people had that mindset that if you dress however you dress, it was your fault, which makes yeah. no sense because you should be allowed to dress however you want. Yes. And the other person should know how to control themselves. Exactly, and the, you know, if you're not if you're not invading their space, they have no reason to invade your space. But Absolutely. back then, it was just they blamed the woman for whatever was going on as her fault. Instead of, no, I was just going to the store. It yeah. was a T-shirt. It is what it is. Yes, the dude did whatever, but they well, you know, you should have. And then even other countries where the women are are wrapped up and and pretty much are, are, are with just their feet showing, the dudes are still losing their minds yes. over feet. So is is the men. Or the not teaching the men how to control their urges is the real problem, not the women. It's the men who are lacking the self control and are projecting on the women as soon as their fault. It's not it's the men. Absolutely. Teach your sons and so forth to control themselves. And, but yeah, I'm sorry. I, I have daughters and I work with models, so I hear this stuff a lot. So it's a weirdness because when I'm doing photography, there's always a sexualness to the images at the same time. I read the comments when the fan just can't say you look great. They got to, you know, always go there with some comments that's way unnecessary. And it's usually not even somebody at the model, though. So it's not even like yeah. they get a pass because it's a friend. It's just some random person decide they just want to, you know, say something real awful and see where it goes. No, And it is weird because what I wear doesn't really impact one way or the other the amount of attention I get. Um, I uh -huh. went through a phase and, and it's weird because my daughter's going through that phase now where I wore 
really high necklines, which I hate because they feel like I, I hate high necklines because I always feel like I'm choking. But I went through right. things where I wore oversized t-shirts and high necklines and long sleeves. Uh -huh. And even in summer, um, I would go and I would swim in a, a big t-shirt. And like, you know, I tried as hard as possible to blend in and people still stared. They still made comments. I got a lot of criticism for like, why, you know, why do you always dress so frumpy? Um, when I moved to Kansas City, I was in my early 20s. And I can remember um, a woman in the workplace pulling me aside and asking to take me shopping. She said, you're way too cute to dress as dumpy as you dress. I was like, I'm trying to wear oh, suits. And I was, you know, I was working in a professional environment. I was trying to wear uh -huh. suits to, you know, to, to fit in as much as possible and not stand right. out. And it's, it's crazy because I would imagine that women of any body type probably experience some amount of that. Right. But it is insane how comfortable people get with telling you what your body should or shouldn't be or how it should or shouldn't look or how you should dress or how you shouldn't dress. And there's no consistency to any of it. And also, they don't even they don't live in your life to understand why you're doing what you're doing. Obviously, you realize, hey, if I dress this way, I have less BS to deal with. I can go in and out to start my day at work and come home about somebody saying whatever or decide they need to ask me out or whatever it is. Oh. So if I dress this way, I could kind of, I'm, I'm a chameleon. I can kinda... And what they have shown is that sexual assault is a power activity. Right. It's not about sexuality at all. Um, True. And, yeah. and I, I saw a really powerful um, exhibit that women posted the outfits they, they were wearing when they were assaulted. Mm -hmm. I was assaulted in college um, by someone I'd gone to high school with who oh. I, I knew well, and he was uh -huh. um, he was the quarterback for our high school football team. So attractive guy, I would have dated him, um, uh -huh. but I never got any hint that that was the energy going on. He, and he roofied me one night and we were hanging out as friends. I wasn't even drinking. Oh, I had God. one drink because he insisted I have a beer with him. And he uh. roofied me. And, and at the time I was wearing a men's white t-shirt and a pair of shorts and a pair of Adidas flip-flops. And oh, wow. when I saw the um, exhibit that women had done, just plain everyday outfits, and it reinforced right. the fact that assault isn't about sexuality at all. It's about right. control power. and power. Yeah. 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 They need to educate more people there. Yeah. I'll, I'll say that's one of the things that's good about what's changing in ways is we're educating people on sexuality and what it really means and the dynamics and, and of what it really means a lot of things so sexual assault isn't so much a mystery you get more understanding so it's less about for lack of what the word i guess slut shaming even though it's not really kind of the same but the idea is that no that's not why that attack happened it had nothing to do with yeah. this it had to do with it so we don't have to keep telling women like what you're saying cover up because cover up they're still being assaulted it's had nothing to do yes. it does, like once again talk to your sons husbands fathers whoever it is to say hey you know there needs to be more therapy out there in general because i'm sure for all these men or people who are feeling these these urges if they had someone they could talk to they'd probably be able to not do it if they were able to have to discuss this and figure out why am i thinking like this but also make a safe place for people to be able to have those conversations that's the other part is sometimes the people have these dark urges the second you tell someone you're or vilified and locked up instead of giving the person a chance to at least prevent themselves from acting on it, but at least they got to be able to talk about it. Well, and I think that you hit on something that's really important for men in general is that I see over and over again articles, men talking about how lonely it is to be a man in today's society and how it's, there is no support network that lets men be men and that let's men talk about how hard it is to have all these expectations and walk the path of being a manly man. Cause just like there's no hard and fast rules for women, you know, mm -hmm. as far as what's appropriate and what isn't. And, and, and as you said, it's, it's crap that what I'm wearing has any bearing whatsoever on anything. Um, but likewise, it's, right. it's unfair that men don't have, 
the support to talk with others and, and kind of understand what it means to be a man today, because there are such conflicting messages. Men are supposed to be sympathetic, empathetic, and they're supposed to be sensitive, but they're all supposed to be manly and aggressive, but not too aggressive. And it's, it's yeah, there's all these messages. Yeah. You got a lot of stuff going on. Uh, the hot button word is the red pill community and that type of thing. That's very divisive because they have such extreme views. And so then they got the other community, where it's like saying beta males, which supposed to like sensitive men, but then like I said, the red pill community, which is supposed to be traditionally masculine men and thinking women belong in kitchen type stuff and 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 women, you know, as well. But then the internet, also the internet is another dangerous place because no matter what you believe, you can find somebody who believes it too. Yeah. And that can make you feel like what you believe is the correct thing because you can find a room full of other people who think the same thing you think. So now you feel like, you know, I'm not wrong. And you got, yeah, you are wrong, but you just found other people who are thinking like you think. And that makes it dangerous, make you feel like what they're thinking is okay. And once again, therapy and having a diverse group of people to be around will help you understand exactly what the quote unquote right thing is. As you said, whatever you focus on is what you see. Three and five, or, or is it two and five women three, have been I assaulted think, or something? Right. Three, and, three out of every five. And I honestly think those numbers are low. Um, yeah. Uh -huh. Every time I talk with another woman and, and a fair number of men, I don't think uh -huh. I've ever talked with a woman who hasn't experienced it. And I'm always yeah. amazed at the number of men that I've just talked with that have experienced it. So I would bet you the numbers are higher. People just don't report it. One of the things that you had sent to me was a little bit of a brief bio, and you said that you had been a photographer for over a decade now. I right. would imagine that yeah. in the guise of that, you've seen a lot of really interesting... Yeah, um, right. When I first started photography, way back when the thing called MySpace existed, <laughs> and so that's how long ago it was, um, my daughter, well, I, I did graphic design so I used to draw a lot and, and do illustrations and that was kind of like my bread and butter I was like hey let me try photography so after my daughter got born uh my my, my first job back in 2007 like hey let me try to really do this photography thing so I went on my space and just finding people in my area between the age of like 18 25 something like that so I found a couple of people that hey I'm trying to do this photography thing you want to do a shoot I'm like okay sure whatever so I just kind of started on there, just taking photography. I just had a point and shoot camera, so nothing complex, no real understanding of settings. It was just, if it looked okay in the camera, I pushed the button, kept moving. I'd go home and Photoshop, but then make it look horrific. Now I look at that stuff now. So at that time, I didn't really understand the idea of making sure that the, the photo itself was good before you throw all that junk on top of it. So I just figured, I'll just throw the junk on top of it and I'll make it look better. Kind of like you're cooking something. Instead of making sure you're cooking the food right, I'll just throw cheese and gravy on it and, and I save the meal. So the first couple of years was kind of me just <laughs> throwing cheese and gravy on everything. So I kind of really got a good understanding composition. Um, yeah, so I kind of started out doing like, there's a lot of goth tattooed models. And then it went into plus size models because uh, uh, plus size group of models like hey we need somebody to take our pictures i see you you're in an area you're really passionate about photography i love you to take our pictures so once i took their pictures it was like wow there's here there's plus size women out there being photographed who's this dude and then they just started contacting me and i was like okay sure because they just had energy about themselves that i hadn't seen with the other models so that really resonated with me to really kind of excite me because they wanted to take pictures they knew they wanted to do that made me want to make my pictures look better. And that's kind of like what really uh, got me started. That was back in like 2009. So it's interesting that you mentioned that uh, the curve of your models had a different energy. Like, what do you think drove that? Um, I think, well, I'll say for these ladies, they just like taking pictures. So they, 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 knew what they wanted to do. When I did shoots before, they kind of would ask me what to do. In my mind, I was still kind of figuring out how to take the pictures right, because I'd be like, okay, I'm taking the pictures. They don't really look like this, but at the time, I wasn't using the gear. I didn't really understand why my photos weren't looking for cine cinematic mm -hmm. or like what's in the magazine book, but like what you were asking in the beginning, they just had a, a great personality about them. They really 
embraced me and I think that really helped to um make me better but like I said once I saw the photos of them while it didn't have any of the photographic stuff the pose and things were so well because they had experience so their experience is what helped make my photos look better but then I started investing in some more gear and then I started actually really this. but then you got me who's like hey I love this I figure if you're paying me or you're taking the time to shoot with me I'm going to post the pictures because that's just respect for what you're doing for taking the time to work with me or to take the time to shoot with me so I was just like hey come on let's shoot and I was just shooting and shooting and it was a, a great start and, and I loved it so one of the things that you uh, talked about is the importance of lighting and for those of us mm -hmm. that don't really know anything about it like is there a tip that you have or I would always say the biggest light source is going to be the most flattering light source so but um so like if you're by a window if you can pull the shade um across the window so that way you don't get the direct light from the window you want to diffuse so it makes the light source bigger but when you use a tiny flash that's right on top of your camera that's just like a little small little cup of water. You try to throw it on them, not really going to get wet. But if you got a big old bucket, they're going to get wet. So the bigger the light source, and of course, closeness to the light. So it's like right now, I'm right under this lamp. So I'm kinda, I'm not the best lit. I need something under me to probably bounce light back up. But you can look to see where the shadows are on your face to figure out, do I turn towards the light? Do I turn away from it? You know, things like that. So basically, just pay attention to where the light is to figure out how you need to either pose or how you need to have your face uh, angled direction-wise. So how about poses? What kind of posing tips do you have? Um, now that, once again, it's all it's always about body type and the clothing. And sometimes when I do some shoots, sometimes the outfits have a lot of clips in the back, pinching things together so that way the outfit sits a certain way. Because you're not going to see the back of the model, you're just seeing the front. So... Maybe I'm kind of pinching the waist of the outfit, or maybe I'm doing something to make the bust look a little fuller. But with poses, I usually just say you want, most people want to look slimmer. So obviously you want to stand up straight. Um, you kind of lean forward just a little bit chest-wise because that's going to be closer to the camera. So the closest thing to the camera is always going to appear biggest. So obviously if you're, if you're voluptuous and you bust the thing you're trying to accentuate, that's what you lean forward with. Or if you're trying to, Decentuate it, then you kind of lean back and bring your hips forward a little bit so that way it makes the hips look a little bit wider and makes your chest look a little bit smaller to slim yourself. So maybe twist your waist a little bit when you pose, bring one leg back, one leg forward, hand on the hip, other hand maybe gesturing towards your face, or maybe both hands on your hips. So it kind of just depends on the outfit, things like that. And like I said, every person is different. So you got to kind of look at that person's body and see what they're able to do or can't do and then season the taste. Cool. Oh, I just learned a lot. Taking photos and, and videos of my outfits, I do it, but I have no idea what I'm doing. Like it's, a, you right. know, so, so that was actually really helpful. See anything on my content that I need to do differently? Let me know. I'm always looking to, to get gotcha. that. Will do. Uh -huh. um, so one of the things that you had mentioned in, in your email was that you have cerebral palsy. Has that yes. impacted your career at all or? Um, I've always felt like if the person is not ready to see me, that can be like, oh, okay, I was not expecting that, or why, or you're, I've always told my kids and most people, I've never been able to approach somebody and say, hey, I'm a photographer, we should do a shoot, because they're just not going to, and the mind, they're going to see this person, they, this guy does pictures, I don't think so, but usually, you know, when you contact me, I'm like, oh, I got to love your pictures, this, 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 or I follow this person, or I've been following you for years and, and we should work together. All right, cool. So I guess it's just once they see me, it's not that what they expected. But then after they see me work, they're like, okay, well, he's doing it. He's making it happen. So I always kind of tell the person that first shoot's always going to be the hardest because that's the one where you don't know what's going to happen. But then once you've had that shoot, you see the images. Oh, okay, he did make it happen. But, I mean, I'm sure they're always going to be aware of my uh, mobility issues. But mm -hmm. when it comes to taking the pictures, you know, they, they was like, do you need me, any help? Oh, I got it. I'm like, okay. So I'm always kidding. I don't want anyone to feel like they need to help me unless I really, really need to help. The photo shoot process is a 50-50 thing. I can only do but so much. They have to do the other part, and we kind of come together in the middle. Well, and I, you know, you were talking about how um, it, it, 
people respond initially and it kind of throws them off their balance. But I would imagine mm -hmm. that first time of working with any photographer, and maybe this is just my own. Oh, um, yeah. Being in True. Mind, like, I think anytime I work yeah. with anybody the first time, part of why I schedule a little bit of space at the beginning of an interview is mm -hmm. to get a sense of, for someone and to get a, our feet underneath us before we're right. like, boom, in the interview. Mm -hmm. Because you're differently abled, it probably helps cut through some of that discomfort because it gives you an, an extra facet. Like you were talking about earlier, you know, when it comes to interacting with people on social media, having that additional facet always kind mm -hmm. of, in my experience, at least it kind of burns through the assumptions and lets us start mm -hmm. from the, from the truth as right. opposed to, you know, when you've got that facade in place, you know, then you've got to, mm -hmm. got to get away from the facade and, and be like, okay, no, here's who I really am. I'll say it's a two-part thing. Uh, for me, I always like to kind of talk to the model a few weeks before the shoot. Like, one I'm doing the next couple of weeks via text, like, hey, what's the outfits? How you doing? Just to try to create a rapport with the person so that way by the time we actually get to the actual shoot, we've got some jokes and, and, and made a little connection, just kind of understanding what we want always try to make sure to go over the shoot one more time the night before because sometimes um a model might purchase outfit she hasn't worn it yet and then she'll put it on and realize oh it doesn't fit that way or maybe you just decide you know i don't want to do this purple look i want to do a red look i also feel like the disability also makes the models feel safer because yeah. i shoot a lot of suggestive stuff and i feel like maybe if that didn't have a disability that can make them feel nervous but I guess they know if James was to act up, I can easily get away. James doesn't act up, but it's just the idea that if something was to go wrong, eh, I think I can beat him up. I'm good. <laughs> and so I think that another thing that works in my favor is that just a good personality, but just knowing that, okay, I don't feel like I'm in danger with this person. So that makes it feel more comfortable to pose in certain ways and wear certain things because it's just a level of safety on their end that maybe with another photographer who's six foot two would be scary to me. I'm six foot two, but I'm in a wheelchair. So the different type of, of six foot two. And I think that adds. So I do feel like in the beginning, the disability did kind of help me because of the stuff I was shooting. It, you know, it was like, hey, I just met this guy and now I'm in some lingerie or some super skinny pee. And if I was on a date, it would take a guy this long to finally see me wearing something like this. He's yeah, I, I could totally see that, you know. Not that I'm comparing this at all to Ted Bundy, but that was um, Ted Bundy would use um, crutches or an arm sling mm -hmm. or those types of things to um, gain women's trust really quickly, and that's a an right. I can see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could. I I never mm -hmm. thought of of that from the standpoint of you know the wheelchair in the um, photography, but I could totally see how that would just yeah because you get you hear the horror stories of photographers and <laughs> doing too much and and yeah. just because a, a, a model or lady whatever term you want to use that's your joke does not mean anything more than she thought you were funny or thought that comment was funny yeah and that's that and unfortunately you know it, i hear horror stories i wish you always communicate with the model and be aware of the model at the time you're doing the shoot don't be so focused at taking pictures that you're not paying attention to the model to see if maybe they're feeling lost because sometimes you're doing a shoot, the model might only have five poses that they know in their mind. And if they've done the five poses, they're like, uh-oh. And if you're so focused trying to get the shot, you're not going to realize that the model needs some guidance. And that's when the photographer and their experience should be able to communicate, hey, you know that one pose, why don't we try a variation that pose with this? Or why don't we go over here and have you sit on this couch or by the window and, and you know because a lot of times the photographers don't communicate with the models they're just pushing buttons and never giving the model any type of um feedback or, or just positive encouragement let them know they're doing good they just don't all they hear is mm -hmm, uh -huh, or the, the photographer stops looking back at the camera and then you just have this dead silence they're not even saying oh that's a great pose and you threw your hair back or they're just like mm -hmm. they're just focused and the models just open everything's going well and the photographer you know a lot of photographers they're not always most socially aware so they're thinking they're doing okay but they're not because i was just sitting wherever and, and heaven forbid the models in some lingerie or nude and they're just sitting wherever and you're just buried in your camera 
amaze at yourself and not telling the model anything. That's a horrible <laughs> feeling. You're sitting there thinking, I can't believe I pay for this. And I'm feeling kind of foolish because the person isn't telling me anything. So let me know that this is going well, or not going well. What do I need to do? So, yeah. And that communication piece is so key in anything, you know, whether it's yeah. it, it, just across the board, but it's amazing how much it, it can really make or break the vibe in a room. You know, it's. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I hear that all the time. Yes. It's a lot don't work on. They just figure, hey, I can take great pictures. But how do you make the model feel? Do you make them feel welcome? Do you make them feel like they were an integral part of the of the process? You know, do you make them feel comfortable? Do they feel safe around you? Are you cold? Are you distant? You know, all that stuff matters because that's part of the experience too. It's, it, it, it's fun to shoot with you. And some photographers are not fun. They're just very technical, get in, get out. And, and you know, I mean, for, that can work for certain models where they just want to do what they got to do, but most want to have a fun experience. So, you know, respect their time, respect them, make them feel valued and, and, and you know, and a lot, of, a lot of time to forget all that stuff. Well, and and so much of a good photo is about the energy that's coming through as you're being photographed. It, you know, right. that's, I I dabble in photography, um, and with my with my kids, but I, I've also done photo shoots for for friends and family. Uh -huh. and the biggest thing that I like to do is to take the time to put everybody at ease and let them feel comfortable because it's amazing that small shift makes a huge difference uh -huh. just knowing when to stop because i've had long shoots and i've looked at the shoots and think wow we should stop like two looks ago she was done a while ago but she didn't realize if i could tell on her face <laughs> or just the poses on the tight as they were but she's like i got energy when i that's one of those type of chances you just have to make depending on yourself if you will if you want to take that chance with that person's time that's tricky and i'm sure that that's something you just learn by years of doing it Right, very true. Yeah, it's, it's like I said, some is really 50 50. You, you have to hope the person is going to uh, meet the demand and kind of jump into it. Other times it's like, no, they were done and get focused. Just show them that you can help make the situation better. That makes a lot of sense. And yeah, that's where you as the photographer set the tone. I can just hear the person not doing well in the bathroom. I'm just kind of sitting there on the couch waiting for them to come back so we can shoot some more stuff and so be the director and say hey what's going on da, da, da. And let's have that conversation and slowly let them tell me what's going on they might just say no i'm okay and they say that let them let them be because either they're processing it or they're already problem solving it or they're not ready to say anything yet because maybe they still haven't come to the realization that maybe this outfit won't work and maybe they, they could be doing whatever try to make it work and I just had to respect them and not try to say, hey, that sounds like something's not working back there. And I just said, okay. And I just sit and wait and see what happens when they open the door. That's cool, though. I mean, because I would imagine with enough creativity, almost anything can be made to work. Maybe not the way that they Very had true. in mind, but right. you know, there's always a way to salvage it in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, the term goes, fake it till you make it. I was saying, yeah. like, you know what, the public, won't know this didn't fit a certain way unless you oh. tell them because fashion in general has such a wide range you can if you tell people it's meant to fit this way or i didn't mind it being tight i'm celebrating my body or whatever it is if you tell them that and you stick to it they're not going to know it, it wasn't supposed to fit a certain way unless it's extremely obvious but within reason there's always ways to work around and find a way to make something into something else and, and, and salvage it somehow yeah Definitely. I mean, that's, that's a great perspective for life in general, which is there's always some way to salvage it. And lots of times my biggest successes in life have looked nothing like what I imagined in my mind they were going to be, you know, yeah. any, any of the biggest things that I've accomplished when I started, I, I had to abandon my expectations because my expectations got in the way of what was actually the true success of the of the project. Are there any last thoughts that you want to leave us with? Um, uh, I'm appreciative of you having me on. Yeah, this conversation definitely started very interesting. I'm talking about photography and we <laughs> went somewhere else, but I mean, conversation is conversation, and I appreciated the chance to be able to talk with you. I've been following your page for a minute, 
obviously, you know, I was hitting you up like, hey, we got to do this, this, and this. So I just appreciate you having me on the show. Um, if anybody's looking forward to doing a photo shoot, I'm sure they'll do that. Click whatever the links are in the caption. Yeah. To find well, me, and, and out. Why don't you tell them real quick right. how they find you? Um, on Instagram is JP Photos by Phelps, all one pump of letters. And then, or just hashtag Photos by Phelps, and you'll find me on social media. Uh, I'm all over the place. So just hashtag Photos by Phelps, put me in Google, Photos by Phelps photographer, all the stuff will show up and you'll be able to find me. Awesome. And I'll get rid right. of the, you. the stumbles. <laughs> <laughs> that's all good you know do what works best for you like i said i've i've always enjoyed what you had on instagram and, and how you carried yourself and how you know how to navigate the certain comments where you don't give it the platform to encourage others who want to say stuff because you, you know how to deal with it and that kind of keeps it within reason so yeah i've always been appreciative of how you're able to yeah. uh dodge all that stuff because you know you're some people play into it unfortunately then that encourage others who figure if I can't get her attention with a compliment, if I say something negative, yes. I'm being acknowledged. And that's what they want. They just want your attention, whatever it takes. Half the time they, they flip flop back after they've got on your nerves and say, Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. And they're, they're, oh, they're clean. And it's yeah. Crazy. It's, it, that, and that was a learning experience for me because um, early on in my social media like, pathway, I. Right. I through several different approaches because like early on um i would just immediately delete and block and then like uh -huh. i went through a fiery phase where i was like oh hold on we're gonna just throw down in the comments and i realized very quickly exactly what you said which is they were just looking to get my attention and the first time that they then would like try to hit on me i'd be like you just said these awful things about me and you're not going to use uh -huh. that and, and it, if it, yeah. it happened enough and I was like, no, we're not going to give you energy to continue to be a jackass. Like, right. If, if you're like, Yeah. The key would be that if you don't like me, why are you following my page? Yeah. That's the key right there. If they don't like you, statistically men are not, men aren't about hate following. Yeah. If they're following your female, it's because they like you or they don't want to admit they like you, but they're all on your page for one reason. Like I said, you you dealt with this, you know, how it, it works and you've kind of cracked the code and know exactly how to navigate this so you can have your peace of mind on social media. <laughs> well, thank you. It's it's come from a lot thank of you. practice in the real world. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I've been there too with just knowing how to, I can tell when people want to ask me a question about my disability because they kind of pause. And I can tell they want to say something or ask, I'm like, what do you want to ask me? And at this point, I'm a, I'm a child of the 80s, so uh, PC-ness that's a new thing for me. So I'm used to questions not exactly being the kindest. And I'm just like, well, what do you want to ask me? And they'll ask it and I'll answer it within the tactful way as possible. And they go, oh, okay. Well, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to ask you, but you still asked it. So you still wanted to ask. Me. So just, you know, it is, but yeah, so I understand the, the, the things you have gone to, not like you do, but I understand how people can, like the thing, the opinions giving you the opinion to help when you didn't ask for it. Or telling yeah. you this is what you could do to make your life better, but yeah. they're not living your life to, you know. Yeah. So I've had those things, you know, you gotta do this, James. Maybe you try that. Like, ah. <laughs> More to it than that. Well, like, okay. You just, you know, you don't want to tell people to shut up leave me alone because you, you you know, in their heart, they're doing something, they're doing that yeah. act of kindness or service. Yeah. But to you, it's frustrating because that might be the twentieth, the hundredth time you've heard that same comment and they think they're telling you it for the first time and you're like i'm a grown-ass woman i've heard that five times every year since this I, time and, and you're telling me it like i've never heard it before yeah it's like, not only oh, that but okay. like I've, I've i've lived this path like you're educating me on a path that you've never walked so right yes so what are you trying to accomplish by telling me how to live my life when i've been living it you know right it's i know what to do i've, I've got it i've got to figure it out i've got a good thing going on. I've, I've got a good way of working. Yes. But I Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Caroline's Adventure podcast. While you're here, subscribe to the show so you're the first to catch new episodes when they're released. And if you enjoyed hanging out with me today, please leave a five-star rating. 
For links to social media and more content, visit the description for this episode or go to carolinesadventure.com. That's Caroline with two A's, adventure.com.